I'm Shahar Azani and welcome to this JBS special featuring the unique story of the JCC in Budapest and how its work with Ukrainian refugees has revitalized its Jewish mission. Until World War II, Hungarian Jews had been well assimilated into secular society for centuries. On the eve of the Holocaust, Hungarian Jews numbered some 800,000 people. But then came the Holocaust decimating Jewish life. Some 600,000 Hungarian Jews perished during the Holocaust. World War II was followed by decades of communism, with religious observance totally suppressed. With the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain, Jewish life re-emerged, re-establishing for the first time in half a century. In 1994, the JDC established the JCC in Budapest, known popularly as Balin Haas due to the generosity of the Balin family of London. Its opening enabled Hungarian Jews to celebrate Jewish cultural life again. Soon, the community was flourishing once more. JCC Budapest lies at the center of that story of rebirth. JCC programs provi provide foundational instruction about Jewish values, culture, and religious practice in a secular, non-judgmental, and safe environment. Our guest today is the man who stands at the very center of this Jewish gem. Marcel Kenesche is the JCC's director. He has been an active member of the Hungarian and Central European Jewish community. And his current position is the culmination of years of education, involvement, and development. He has been involved in the Haver Informal Jewish Educational Foundation as a volunteer, informal educator, and general advisor, organizing and conducting dialogue programs for Hungarian public school students. After earning a political science degree from LTE University Faculty of Law, he officially began his career in the Jewish community and has been there since, applying his passion and talent to several roles and organization. Among his many achievements, Marcel helped establish the Israeli Cultural Institute in Budapest in 2008 and became JCC director in September of 2020. Marcel extends his expertise to other organizations as a board member for the UCCU Informal Roma Educational Foundation, the Haver Informal Educational Foundation, and Centropa, the Charity Taxi Foundation, and the Dutch Jewish Humanitarian Fund. Wow. Marcel, it's a pleasure to have you with us in New York at the JBS Studios in Times Square. How are you? It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. And we are excited to hear about this incredible revival. You know, very rarely do we speak about Jewish life, especially in Europe, in terms of revival. The ongoing conversation is usually centered around anti-Semitism or persecutions, unfortunately, even these days. And here you are with a set of different news for us. Yes, actually, uh, Hungary is a place of Jewish revival. And if you have, haven't visited uh, Europe or Hungary, this is the time to come because you will see uh, a re-energized uh, Hungarian Jewish community, a Hungarian Jewish community that raised from its ashes. We have seen so many people join the community in the past 30 years. I am one of the perfect examples and embodiments, em embodiments of Jewish revival. I come from a family that is you a know, Jewish family. That, that's, that's actually a great point because when, when we listen to your extensive and most impressive bio, we see somebody who is passionate about Jewish life, who is very connected to it. And I'm sure each and every one of our viewers is wondering how do you make more of you? Like, how do you get so involved, so caring, so passionate, and so dedicated to the Jewish people? So I became me because of programs that allowed me to discover Jewish identity from a positive perspective. I was raised up in a family where we didn't talk about Judaism. I was 13 when I found out that I'm Jewish. I was already a student in a Jewish school. So where did you grow up? So I grew up in Hungary. I was born in Hungary. I have an older brother and an older sister, uh, and they grew up under socialism. And I, as the youngest of three kids, I was born in 83. I was the first to get the opportunity to experience uh, programs like Jewish schools, Jewish summer camps, being an activist at the JCC. So I was really the first in the family who started to bring back Judaism to a family that has abandoned Judaism well, I, I for have two to, generations. I, this is outstanding. So it didn't start with your parents or siblings. It actually no. started with you. 
it started with me. My father was born in 44 June, so basically uh, he was a Holocaust survivor, making me technically a second generation Holocaust survivor. And for my grandparents, being Jewish was the primary threat to the family. They wanted to keep this as a secret, to hide this. They uh, cut all ties with the Israeli part of the family. They cut all ties with Judaism. My father just figured out by accident that they are Jewish. But the only thing he knew about being Jewish is that we were persecuted and the rest of the family was murdered because we were Jewish. So they didn't want to provide uh, uh, our family and the kids with the Jewish education because they didn't know what's there. So not only the Holocaust happened in Central Eastern Europe, 50 years of communism have not really given the opportunity uh, for people to discover Judaism from, from a different perspective and angle. And thanks to actually American visionary thinking, organizations uh, like the JDC uh, and American visionary thinkers came to Europe and they started programs that became the cornerstones of rebuilding Jewish identity. Cornerstones of rebuilding Jewish identity in a way uh, that is uh, not religious, that is very secular, that is very open-minded, that shows that Jewish identity can be so much more than uh, praying. Jewish identity can be so much more than looking into the past. Uh, and I am lucky. I am lucky because I was able to uh, convince my family to celebrate Pesach for the first time. Oh, but I, I, I still have to understand, at the yes. age of 13, you decide that you want to be actively Jewish. Why? Well, it was a process. But for me, uh, these Jewish programs gave an identity. So I don't know where I would be without these Jewish programs. But what I do so know... through the programming? Through the programming. And so, how did you get to the programming? Like, so what made I, you go there? First, I went to a Jewish school and I kept on being interested in Jewish programs. So I just couldn't stop. Uh, I started to have friends, I went to the summer camp, and I was looking always for some kind of Jewish engagement. And even when I was in university and I was studying political science, of course I was focusing on the history of the Middle East and Israel, right. because I had to have some kind of a connection. And when I got my master's, uh, I really didn't want to uh, do something that is not Jewish, because I felt that this is important. We have to, we have to rebuild Jewish life here. And in Hungary, there are actually so many people who are Jewish. Hungary is the third largest uh, Jewish community in the oh, European wow. Union. And Hungary uh, has seen the largest uh, growth in Jewish community that is based on self-discovery. Germany has seen a lot of new Jews coming, but they came from Ukraine and Russia. Uh, in Hungary, people found out that they are Jewish. So my story is not unique. My story is the story of the Hungarian Jewish community. How we became from a fragmented, small, uh, very Holocaust-oriented uh, community, how we became something much stronger uh, with a positive identity. And now if you come to Hungary, and I encourage you to do so, you see programs like our, our festival, Judafest. It's a big street festival, 10,000 people come. We have a Jewish film festival that is happening every year. Thousands of people come. It's the most popular film festival in Budapest currently. Uh, you see uh, youth movement programs. Uh, you see uh, more summer camps. Uh, you see so many different types of engagement opportunities for youth. And just imagine the people who went through the experience like me, they start to have kids now. The kids are growing up in more Jewish environments. So we have jumped from, uh, in the beginning of the 90s, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, there were maybe a few thousand people who would say that they are Jewish. Today there are 20,000 people who would identify as such. In Hungary, according to soci sociologists, there are 120,000 people with Jewish uh, background, so right. meaning at least Jewish one grandparent. So just imagine, over the period of 30 years, we jumped from 5,000 to 20. Imagine where we could be in another 30 years, in another generation, we could jump from 20 to 40 or 50,000 people. And that's what we are doing in the JCC. We are, try, we are galvanizing community. We are offering ways for people to engage uh, with Judaism. Uh, we well, have, I'll tell you this, Marcel. Yes. It definitely worked for you. But I still, I'm still stuck a little bit about that element in your beginning. When you come back home to a family that has been estranged from its Jewish roots, and you decide you have this craze. 
you're going to do this Jewish thing. You're going to be involved in those programs. How did your father react? What did your siblings say? What did your mother say? Like, was there any objection on their end? Did they fear for your safety? How, how, how were you able to navigate that? Yes, very good point. So it was controversial. So some of my family members reacted uh, uh, not in a positive way especially my brother, who was beaten up in high school because he is Jewish. Right. Uh, so he had a very negative experience about being Jewish. He had a more negative experience being Jewish than my father, who was only a baby when the Holocaust happened. And he was not beaten up because he is Jewish. They were hiding in the basement, but as he was growing up, it just didn't matter. My brother had a negative experience, and when I started to be openly and loudly Jewish, my brother had like concerns for me, and still has. Uh, but as I was, uh, as I was bringing uh, this stuff uh, home, for instance, the first Seder night we celebrated, right. that was a huge success. First Seder night. First Seder how night. How did that go? First Seder night after I don't know how many generations. Uh, uh, I was the rabbi, but I was also the youngest, so I had to... The how old were you at the time? Uh, 14. So the Manishtana went like this, that I was asking the questions and I was answering <laughs> the questions <laughs> myself. My family had no idea what that is, but actually they were very supportive but because we are an intellectual family and they were curious about this thing. Uh, and they started to be more and more curious. And the first Seder night was a success, I think, because of the compulsory four glasses of wine that the whole family had <laughs> to drink and I made sure that they drink it. Uh, but also because uh, for my parents... It At the was age of 14, I hope nobody in the authorities uh, is listening. Yep. Yeah, I, I did not drink yeah. uh, wine. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I don't remember if I drank. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was a good thing for my parents because they saw their son uh, taking initiative and being proactive in something. So they supported more my proactivity and that I, I'm full of it energy and that I'm interested in something. They supported that. And the fact that it's the Jewish part, they were like okay with it in the beginning. After a while, after years, uh, they became more and more uh, supportive, especially when they saw that actually this is also what uh, I want to do professionally. And they've seen me succeed, uh, so they, uh, they could not have been more supportive after that. But uh, there, are still, uh, there are still some concerns uh, when I'm in the news, when I'm outspokenly uh, speaking about something, and anti-Semitism did not disappear from the face of Earth. Uh, but I do think that... But you are, you are changing the conversation, Marcel. Instead of just talking about Europe, Jewish, and anti-Semitism, because that's usually what goes hand in hand in a sentence, here you are, I think energetic as anyone could ever be, <laughs> speaking with such passion about Jewish revival. May I ask you, what attracted you to the Jewish world to begin with as a child? Was there an incident? Was there a story? Was there something specific that, that led you in that direction? Yeah, although I'm very positive in my Jewish identity right now, and all that we do at the JCC is trying to give more than the Holocaust, the very first thing that led me to discover Judaism was the Holocaust, because I was very interested in what happened with our family. I remember for the first time when I sat down with my aunt who passed away, she was an Auschwitz survivor, oh, wow. and I didn't know about her before this discovery journey. Uh, and she showed me for the first time in my life, she created uh, with her hand this family tree. And that was the first time I've seen my family on like this big, it was, it was like with glue, they were put together different sheets of paper. And uh, I saw my great, great, great grandfather here and I was like somewhere here in the bottom. Uh, and then some large parts of the family did not make it to the, this part of the family tree. And I saw these little stars of David uh, at some of the names in the same period. And I was asking my uh, aunt, what are those? What's those stars of David? And she said, those are all uh, your family members who were victims of the Holocaust. And then it struck me that, oh my God, how many cousins, how many would second cousins I uh, right. would have had? What kind of life these people had? And this aunt of mine, she made sure that I know about the life of these people because she remembered a lot of those people. And I was very interested in the family stories. And these family stories uh, kept me going in the beginning. And then as I was discovering uh, these Jewish family stories, I, st I, I couldn't stop thinking about what kind of Jewish life we can uh, build up uh, in Hungary, what kind of Jewish life we can, uh, Marcel, we can make happen. what you say manifests the principle of really out of destruction comes great 
reaction. And it's really inspirational to hear you embody that message. So now that you've um, tempted me um, to come and visit Budapest and see you at the JCC, tell me a little bit about what you actually do on the ground. What kind of programs do you offer on the day-to-day, -day, ordinarily, you know, services you provide for the community? So JCC does uh, three main things. Education, uh, entertainment, and social responsibility. Education is about educating people uh, about Judaism, meaning how we can bring closer uh, Jewish values to people who are living in the 21st century, and uh, Jewish values that are evergreen, uh, lifelong learning, critical thinking, the importance of debates, helping the poor. I could go on and on and on and on. So we make sure that we educate people how to, uh, how to celebrate holidays and how to uh, stand on Jewish principles and values. Uh, entertainment, it's one of the biggest weapons for uh, people, outreach. People are intrigued by it. Yes, people are intrigued by it, but entertainment is a very important tool because that's how we outreach uh, to people who are unaffiliated. So that's why we have a Jewish film festival, that's why we have Judafest, which is a big, if you are on September 18th, if you come to Budapest, you will see a big street festival with 10,000 of people uh, coming and tasting Jewish food and dancing to Jewish music and concerts. Uh, our film festival is in, uh, is in November. And we have other entertainment programs that is connected to singing, dancing. So it gives people the opportunity to connect to Judaism in a light, uh, in a light way. And then once we lure them in, then we can also uh, convince them to participate in other things. And social responsibility is a key piece because that is how we uh, make people active in the Jewish community. And the Ukrainian refugee crisis was the perfect Wait, example. Wait, before we touch on that, because that's actually the next thing I wanted to cover with you. Do, since you have such a rich diversity of offerings, do you get non-Jews? Um, at those events? Yes, we do. So uh, the JCC Budapest is one of the strongest bridges between Jews and non-Jews in Hungary uh, because we believe uh, that building bridges uh, and partnerships and uh, creating a, a society that is more just and being very active uh, in, in caring for, uh, for things mm -hmm. that are not only Jewish. We have a special education need, uh, kids for, kids with special education needs. We are helping them. We have You also have club. fun. You mentioned we, entertainment. We, we have People fun. People come to enjoy. We and also, I think that's a great way to fight anti-Semitism as well, by introducing yourself to the uh, general public. That's right. That's right, and they see uh, Jews not as uh, uh, strangers anymore because they see them that, you know, they have the same kind of motivations, they also like to dance to music, they also like food. Uh, and we create these opportunities for people to come together and get to know uh, each other, and more importantly, uh, there are some people who have Jewish backgrounds and we reach out to them uh, that, uh, as non-Jews because they think they are not Jewish. Right. And they come in and at the later stage they discover that, oh, but I have a Jewish grandma. Right. Uh, so and it suddenly happens. suddenly something to be proud of, not to be ashamed of. Exactly, exactly. And they see a positive example how they can live their Judaism, even if they did not see anything like that before. And it doesn't happen from one day to the other, but now we have 30 years to look at, and we have seen so many examples of self-discovery. Uh, you know, the most extreme is like, of course, uh, right-wing politicians figuring out that they have a, a Holocaust survivor grandmother. Right. But we have seen so many stories uh, like that. And the programming we are doing is ensuring that more and more people will have the ability to discover themselves and their identity. And more and more people will be able to go on a journey like, uh, like I did. Uh, and what, I think what's that's the level of anti-Semitism you encounter in Budapest, in Hungary today? So in Hungary, if you compare it to other countries, uh, I think our situation is a little bit better. Uh, we don't have... Are you uh, affected by the politics? Um, by the politics and the public discourse, there is anti-Semitism and there is always... Uh, anti-Semitism is always used in a political way uh, because there is, a, uh, uh, there is a way people react to certain things that says about the Jews. Uh, but there are no anti-Semitic assaults on people. There is vandalism. 
uh, and, and there's anti-Semitic language, and of course that's bad, and anti-Semitic language can lead very As easily to very assault, well, yeah. so we have to be very vigilant about this. Uh, but so far, Hungary was uh, lucky enough to be a relatively safe space. So if you come to Jewish programs in Hungary, you see less security than you see in other countries. But do you get support from the local government as far as safety and security are concerned? Uh, yes, yeah, so the government uh, really wants peace, uh, so they, they don't want uh, situations to escalate, uh, but we have to look after ourselves. For sure, like any Jew anywhere. You mentioned the um, Ukrainian refugee situation. Naturally, many countries in Europe were affected by the situation in the Ukraine, but in your case, you're actually saying that the, the, the crisis has revitalized your work at the JCC and the Jewish community. So share with us a little bit about A, what you do in light of the crisis and how did that happen, that it's revitalized your mission? That's right. So the very first day the crisis broke out, it was no question for us that we will do uh, the most we can to help Ukrainian refugees. And to make it clear, the JCC was not designed to be a humanitarian crisis center. Right. We had to learn this, but we were sure that we have to use the resources of the Jewish community to help people uh, in need. Uh, and we have seen tens of thousands of people crossing the Hungarian border, uh, fleeing their homes. Uh, so we joined forces with other Jewish organizations uh, as well. We created a Jewish community coalition. Uh, and the JCC itself created a, don a donation center. So people from the Hungarian uh, local community have brought in a lot of donations, like clothes, hygiene product, products, and the Ukrainian refugees are taking them. Even today, we have uh, 100 refugees daily coming to the JCC and collecting, uh, collecting clothes and products, whatever they need. Uh, we, also, uh, we also called for help and we created a volunteer management program. So Hungarian locals came to help in unprecedented numbers. We always have volunteers to our programs, but during the Ukrainian crisis, we have seen people emerge from the shadows, people who were uh, Jewish or had some kind of Jewish uh, affiliation, but a weak one. But when the crisis came, they wanted to offer their help and they offered their help in the frames of the Jewish community uh, because they felt, uh, they felt that that's where their uh, help is more targeted. Uh, and uh, besides that, we also, with the help of the volunteers and also help of volunteers coming from the US as well, by the way, and Israel, Russian speakers came to help. Uh, to the JCC, thanks to JDC and UJ Federation. Uh, we started to organize programs for the refugees so that they will feel a little bit more human again. They are not just refugees, they are human. Yeah, people. They are people. So we started to organize educational programs for the kids. We started to organize social programs for the elderly. We started to organize cultural programs. We, uh, we started to organize support groups for uh, some of the people, like moms who came with their kids. It's mostly elderly people and moms with their kids who are coming because the men stayed behind to right. fight. Right. Uh, and we tried to accommodate them as much as possible. But what was uh, uh, heartwarming to see uh, is the level of activism and also uh, this ancient Jewish law, how it became our everyday reality. Kol Israel Aravim Zebaze. All Israel is responsible for each oh, other. Yeah, this right. is something we used to say in summer camp, and we don't really know the meaning when we sing it, you know, we just say it. But when this crisis broke out, uh, the same day, I got phone calls and emails uh, from the idea, the, US. the Jewish principle of human solidarity. Of human solidarity, exactly. And people from Hungary showed up to help. People from the US showed up their support, saying, Marcel, whatever you need, we are behind you. And it was like people having our backs. And we had to create an entire operation that we were honestly not prepared to do. We had to hire people. We had to create systems, structures. Uh, and so you mobilized the entire JCC operation to support those refugees. And you're telling me that you had those glimmers of light, people who had no shadow of a hint that they were Jewish, who suddenly found you through that assistance program? Yeah, so we didn't stop with our regular programming. Uh, so that so, still goes on. So that still goes on, and that made it very difficult to uh, to do right. to do things. Right. Uh, but we did see people uh, from the Jewish community who are not so active. 
uh, we did see people who are non-Jews who came to help to the Jewish community because for some reason they thought that uh, it's an insurance uh, to offer their help in the frames of the Jewish community. Uh, and we basically uh, uh, created a program with our partners that, uh, that supported the Ukrainian refugees that was complementary to the uh, government services that were provided for the refugees and I don't want to go into details to that but it was obviously not enough what the uh, what the Hungarian state could provide for them we wanted to do more right. and this is a human obligation and who should understand better uh, being a refugee uh, than the Jewish people yeah and what, what a great opportunity also to showcase you know to the entire Hungarian public and the world really what being Jewish really means as far as involvement in the plight of others, not just ourselves. We know that one of the most horrible, you know, anti-Semitic tropes is that Jews only care about themselves. And what you're telling us here, Marcel, is the exact opposite. Yeah, good deeds are more important than wisdom. Because if you have uh, wisdom, but you don't do good deeds, you can put your wisdom in your pocket. Right. But uh, if you are doing good deeds, then wisdom will come along with it. And that's what, we, uh, that's what we believe in and that's what we do. Marcel, if anybody wants to check you uh, out online, see what you're up to, maybe even get in touch with you, how do they do that? Go to friendsofjccbudapest.com. You will find friends all the of friends J of JCC Budapest. Yes, you will find, you can Google us, friends of JCC Budapest. Or if you just Google JCC Budapest, uh, then you will find us. You will find information about what we do, how we engage people, how we revive Hungarian Jewry, and how we became one of the success stories after the Second World War of rebuilding Jewish life in places that were devastated by the Holocaust and then socialism. And Hungary is a place to come to because people should really experience and see with their own eyes what's happening with the Hungarian Jewish community. And it's going to continue this growth. You know, on a personal note, um, your enthusiasm is quite contagious. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope so. <laughs> and also the great message that you as a kid, you change the trajectory of your entire family. I can imagine they're much more involved than they used to be today. Yes, they are more involved than they used to be today. But also not only my family, a lot of my friends uh, and a lot of the people I know, uh, even if they are not Jewish, they started to become more interested in this. Uh, and we believe that uh, if we have a Jewish community that is as enthusiastic as I am, and they are, uh, then it will have a snowball effect. And it's, it is already having it a is. snowball effect. So I, I can imagine for all of our viewers, this is an open invitation to come visit you at the JCC in Budapest. This is an open invitation. Please come and visit us, visit Hungary, visit Buza Budapest, and visit the Hungarian Jewish community and the JCC. Thank you so much, Marcel, for joining us and for all that you do to strengthen Jewish life and the Jewish community as a whole. You have definitely shown us a great example of how this could actually be done. And I hope all of you, our viewers, will take Marcel's example and implement in many other parts of the world, making the Jewish people stronger and more united than ever before. This has been incredible, Marcel. I'd like to thank all of you for watching this JBS special. I'm Shahar Azani, and until next time, Shalom and Lehitraot. See you soon, maybe in Budapest. Please to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.